cheetahs really are the, the underdogs of the large carnival world. It's incredibly rewarding to reintroduce them into a reserve like Salati where there's lion, there's leopard, there's hyena and to see them actually survive and reproduce. It's not dangerous to humans. I'd never deliberately walk towards leopard or lion. You know, with cheetah you never really feel threatened and they become very habituated to human presence. They really are a wonderful animal to see and experience in the bush. Cheetahs is sort of a, a fake big cat, if you like. Uh, they, they can roar, so they, it separates them from leopard and lion. Habituate very quickly around humans, which really helps when we're monitoring them because we can get nice and close. We can really see if there's any injuries, when they're fed last, all, the, all of those sort of things. And um, as you can see, they are very comfortable around us. Um, they don't see us as a threat at all. Um, and uh, it gives us great sightings. It also helps us monitor them very well. Yeah. As you saw, these two cheetahs both had collars on. And that's for monitoring and, and research and just trying to find out what they're doing, where they're spending their time, and how much they are hunting and what are they hunting. Mad? Mad? It's the one in front, eh? An operation of putting a collar on is, is quite interesting. Um, and with these two boys, because they're brothers, and they've had that lifelong partnership. To dart one of them and, and leave the other one, they're so close, they just want to come and investigate and, and find out what's going on and why their brother's not moving and all the rest. I hear that in the vocalization of the, the, the brother trying to call for the animal that's been darted and trying to work out what's going on. brother just wanted to follow us and see what was going on and kept walking around trying to work out what's happening with his brother. Which means we have to work quickly and we have to take measurements because it's stressful for, for both animals. And while you're monitoring the femoral, then just watch the, the paw or in the jaw. Once we've finished fitting the collar, we take measurements, we weigh the animal, take all the data down that we need, and then we wake them up. So the effects of the drugs last 15-20 uh, minutes after the, after the wake up, so they do appear quite drowsy and a bit drunk. But they're actually they're 100%, that's fine, that's completely normal. The two brothers are reunited very, very quickly afterwards. Yeah, all was well. So as a species, cheetah are very unique, especially in terms of cats as a whole. They're very different than lion or leopard, um, your other big cats. So they're, they're built for speed and they're built for dexterity and they have a very slender build. Their spine is almost elastic. This big S-shaped spine which catapults them forward when running. Their nasal passages and circulatory system is built for that extra flow of oxygen to keep them going. Cheetahs have this very characteristic tear marks down their face, which is to keep the glare of the sun when they're, when they're hunting. And that's mainly because they hunt mostly in the day compared to leopard and lion, which would hunt at night. They have that long tail, rudder-like tail to change direction if they need to and keep up with their prey. Cheetahs have a really good camouflage. They have this spot pattern, much like the leopard, uh, which just makes them blend into all sorts of different environments. In this long grass or this thick bush, they can really do well at hiding. They're much more docile than other big cats, which also makes them more vulnerable. The IUCN categorizes these guys as vulnerable, uh, their conservation status as vulnerable. 
and there's only six to 8,000 left in the wild, uh, which makes conserving these guys really, really important. Uh, it might sound like a lot, but actually six to 8,000 is, is nothing com compared to their historic numbers and, and the range they used to have. They used to occur uh, very widely historically, you know, uh, throughout Africa except for the forested regions. And then right across the Middle East, uh, all the way uh, to India, and uh, all the way north to Russia, the former Soviet Union, you know. In the 1970s, there were still cheetahs in Russia. So obviously over the past 13,000 years since agriculture started, cheetah have just, um, they've decreased, uh, they've been eradicated from 91% of their historical range. And agriculture only hit southern Africa about 1,500 years ago. So we, ha we really are ecologically the healthiest place in Africa and we therefore have the largest cheetah population because we've only had 1,500 years of agriculture. We've got about 4,000 cheetah in, uh, in southern Africa, but cheetah have been wiped out from 78% of their historical range in southern Africa. So they went through a pretty massive bottleneck several thousand years ago, and that reduced the gene pool to a very small number. Um, so the risk for inbreeding for a cheetah is very high at the moment. Our genetic swapping and sort of monitoring and managing our cheetah population is with the Endangered Wildlife Trust. So because the landscape's been completely, um, you know, transformed by human activities, there's only, you know, small little islands of natural bush left with, with wildlife in it. These small little islands, Salati being one of them, 27,000 hectares, have the capacity to support about 10 cheetahs. Salati probably up to 15 if they wanted to. And uh, that's, you know, that's not a genetically viable population. So sooner or later, if you left those 15 cheetah to themselves, you know, there would be, there would inevitably be inbreeding. Um, it would start off with cousin, cousin, and it would eventually land up with father, daughter, mother, son, uh, direct siblings breeding with each other. And that implies a whole lot of things uh, for, for any mammal species. Uh, and this is why a genetically viable population size for any mammal is about a thousand individuals. Uh, if you've got a thousand individuals, you have enough genetic genetic material to prevent inbreeding in future and to adapt to changing conditions. So we want a thousand individuals to adapt to climate change because we know that the weather is going to change in future. We know that the vegetation will change. We know that they'll encounter new and very, you know, different diseases in future. So we want them to have that genetic diversity to, to adapt. So often people think cheetahs just need savannah and open plains, um, which is not the case. They do very well in, in uh, thick bush. And we have quite a bit of mixed habitat here on Salati and the, these two cheetah boys have done really well. And you can see they're very healthy. They kill something every three or four days. Because these cheetahs are so relaxed uh, around humans, they often walk through the, the research camp. And um, we've even seen them kill some of the warthogs and, and nyala around the camp before, even in the camp. They're not a threat to humans at all. They don't see us as prey. They don't mind sharing our space, which is pretty cool. The volunteers coming to Salati Research will be thrown right into the deep end of monitoring these guys. They will uh, be able to have some incredible sightings, walking in and uh, just sitting with these guys and just understanding them a bit better. It's, it's vitally important at the end of the day that we, we continue collecting data on these guys and the volunteers play a part in it. It's pretty amazing to be directly involved in the operations of putting that collar on and then you can follow up and see where the animal is and track it and you know we collect data on what they're hunting and where they are in their home ranges, um, who they're mating with, the genetics, all of those things. So it's very interesting and important to be involved in both the data collection as well as the physical finding them, putting that collar on, seeing how it's directly influencing their protection and safety. Salati represents a massive conservation win, you know, uh, to take 270 kilometers squared of land previously utilized for agriculture and to hand it to conservation. I mean, that's essentially what uh, Salati have done. You know, they've not only created safe space for cheetah conservation, which is a, a, a red list species, they've also created safe space for pangolins, for rhinos, for elephants, for lions. And these were all species that were historically completely extirpated from that area. And hopefully the Salati model can replicate itself elsewhere. You know, we need more private owned uh, game reserves in South Africa. We need state reserves to learn from uh, reserves like Salati how to manage wildlife responsibly and to maximize their conservation value.